So we'll be jumping into this. Um, I'm joined by two really great creators here. We've got uh, Sarah and, um, and Sean. Um, I'm not going to introduce you. I think you'll do a better job of introducing yourself. So I'll hand it over to you first, Sarah, and you introduce yourself and your channel, a little bit about what you do. Sure. So I am Sarah Renee Clark on YouTube. Um, I create lots of art content. So we've definitely talked a lot about AI with other artists. And I also make a lot of products on the side as well, which I'm talking about more in some other sessions. So. Hi, I'm Sean. So I'm a travel creator. I like to create long form videos on YouTube. Um, I do travel vlogs, travel films, I like to go into topics like solo travel, um, going out of your comfort zone, going to you know, little hidden gems. And I also like to travel to Japan. <laughs> <laughs> What's the name of your channel? Shawnee Deb. Now, yeah. uh, okay. <laughs> you should got it. <laughs> nice. And look, I've, I've only just recently come across your content. It is fantastic content. Like we would deal with creators all over the world who make amazing content and I was blown away by the oh, quality of your so Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you so much. I definitely recommend checking it out. And Sarah's obviously as well. Sarah I've known for a long time. Yeah. Great. So look, we're going to be chatting about the pros and cons. Now, AI has an enormous amount of potential for creators uh, and artists, right? But on the other hand, there are a lot of problems associated with it. There's a lot of controversial topics like from the way it understands and learns how to work and the amount of content it can basically spew out at scale. There are all these issues. So we'll be chatting about the pros and cons. So first thing I want to do is talk about the pros. Let's see all the good things about it. And then we'll go into some of the, the more tricky things. All right. So first thing, Sarah, how do you use AI in your workflow? Do you use AI at, at all? Yeah, I actually, so when AI first came out, I jumped on it pretty quickly. Um, I've probably scaled back a bit since, but I do find chat GPT for me is really useful in the brainstorming process. Um, I use it a lot if I've got an idea to help me generate 20 similar ideas, but I'd never use it for the final output. I use it for that first step of just kind of like having someone to bounce off, to bounce off ideas, to sort of think of a word that I can't think of and things like that. Um, and we do use other tools that are within some of the programs like Photoshop, um, I'm able to clean up images a lot quicker for our thumbnails using the AI selections. And we also use it to clean up audio and a few other things like that. Sure. So for me, I don't really use it to generate ideas. Um, I use it more to clean up you know, thumbnails, remove unwanted elements. Um, I think the one in Photoshop, Generative Fill, is the one that I use the most. Um, it's magic because you wouldn't be able to do something like that you know, a few years back. So generative feel this function is, to me, a game changer to really seamlessly remove unwanted elements or to, you know, if your photo is too tight or close up, I can use it to expand the photo so that it's a bit of a wider photo for the thumbnail. So um, I use Photoshop a lot. And also I think the one from Adobe, it's um, Enhanced Speech. Um, that one helps to clean the audio like magic. Um, if the audio is too soft or there's too much noise, um, you, you know, in the past, you have to use very ancient plugins to try and remove noise, but it's never perfect. So right now, I think the cleanup um, for speech is really, really good. So I would say I use it more as, as a cleanup tool right now in my workflow. Was it easy to uh, uh, bring into your workflow? Was it like, did you feel very natural or did you feel you had to like go out and have a hunt around and see what made sense to you? So for cleanup tools, I think it's very easy, very seamless to integrate into my workflow. But when it comes to, say, generating ideas, I try to dabble with it, but maybe I'm just not good with prompts. Because I think to generate ideas, you have to be... It's a skill to generate specific prompts for what you need. So I'm still trying to dabble with it. And um, the ideas that I get from AI, you know, like from ChatGPT or Gemini, from Google is still quite generic for me when I try to generate ideas. So I'm still trying to work on the prom skills for me. How about yourself? Did you have to <laughs> oh, find new learning to do it. workflow? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, again, like you're saying, with Photoshop, for example, a lot of the AI is built in places where I was doing things anyway and it was just like an extra little assistant. So I found those ones are really easy to adapt to. Um, Tools that weren't built in, so like you mentioned, the I think it's called Adobe Podcast yeah. um, that is good for cleaning up audio. I love it and it's like magic, but we don't use it very often because it involves exporting, putting it in a separate thing. So things that are like their own standalone thing, I don't tend to use as much. 
whereas the ones that are built in I found really quick to adapt to. I'm going to do a demonstration of Adobe Podcast tomorrow in the session on 10 tips. Just a little nice. plug there. Yeah. Anyway, um, what, what thing I'm, I'm, I'm keen to see or listen, hear more of is like what we find working with creators around the world is that they're very excited by the prospect of what AI can do, but it tends to be back to within their workflow. If they have to hunt too far for a tool, they won't do it. Like, so like for example, you talk about the Adobe suite, mm. right? You already use that, so you're more likely to, to be geared more towards the Adobe yeah. suite, right? What, is there anything that you're particularly excited about as part of your workflow coming up that you think will be a really good tool? Mm, one is definitely AI Sora. Um, I think that one is everyone's really blown away by the capabilities of that. And I see it again more as a tool, as a content creator, um, if I need stock videos or images that could elevate the content a little bit more or to illustrate a certain idea more like say, can I create a map of a, a car going from this point to this point? Because right now it's still very, you have to do it manually, you know, there's no AI that could generate animation for you like that. So it's a very tedious process for me to generate, say for example, maps, because I, I create travel content. So if there's somehow a program that could help me generate a simple animation of something like that, then I think I would be very excited for it. So I would say in the space of video AI, that's something that I'm really looking forward to, yeah. And how about you, in your workflow, is there something you're excited about? I think for me, it's actually more the data processing side of things. So because I come from an art background and I have a lot of friends that are artists, I'm a bit more hesitant on using some of the generative stuff, but in using ChatGPT or versions of that, to uh, process a lot of information that would just take hours doing it by yourself. That's more where I'm interested. So recently we did a survey trying to help get results from people about a product and rather than um, putting them in an Excel table and only offering people multiple choice questions, we were able to give people a chance to have open answers, which means it's more useful feedback, but then we didn't have to have someone sit and read every single answer the chat GPT was able to take them all and summarize and say, okay, these there are about 20 people that brought up this topic and it's able to decipher the different language and recognize the patterns. And so that pattern recognition for me is a huge time saver, but allows us to get way more in-depth insights than we could if we tried to simplify any other way. Amazing, yeah, it's, and it's getting better and better, isn't it? Yeah. Is there, what are you most excited about with the tools coming out for creators? The tools as in... Um, is, there, is there a tool out there that you've seen that you're like, this will be really cool? Like, is there a bit of tech you've seen that looks really good that you may not have tried yet? Um, I think, I mean, AI Sora, like I mentioned, AI Sora is something that I would love to dabble in. Um, I've seen maybe AI for music currently, but it's the, the music that it's generating is still quite... Um, it's, it's not there, the quality yet. So, because I, I have a hard time finding music for my videos. So if I could have, again, another tool that could replicate um, the music that I like and say, for example, I give a sample track and then it could produce a track that is maybe similar in terms of the feel to it, um, then that would help me in finding, you know, good quality music um, rather than to see through all of the existing music. And it, sometimes it takes me hours to find a good track for my video. So if AI can also bring that closer um, to produce, you know, not so generic feeling music, then that again is another step forward. But wouldn't it be great though? Like, I mean, I don't know how many times you've found a track for your video and you're like, oh, I just wish it was just a, a little bit faster or the yes. vocals would change. If you could just exactly. type in a prompt, you yes. could do that. Or maybe like, can I prompt like, okay, maybe have the, the, the verse or the starting part to be a bit more mellow. That would be amazing if you could edit according to prompts to the music. Yeah. Very cool. How about yourself? So I keep forgetting the questions. Wow. <laughs> Sorry, what? I'm so intrigued what? by what he's saying. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe well, I should answer first next What time. are you excited about when it comes to the new tools? Um, okay, there are actually a few tools that I've seen that are all kind of working on the same goal that I'm probably the most excited about. And that's um, on YouTube, uh, managing comments. So at the moment, it's kind of like when creators get to a certain size, they just start ignoring their community and they just stop reading comments. Or even for smaller creators, you have to filter between all the comments that just say first or love you versus the ones that are really in depth and thoughtful. And then you've also got sometimes like with me that has products, tech support questions in your comments, which is silly. We tried to train people not to do that, but it still happens. 
So I've seen a lot of tools now that are trying to help you surface the important comments. They're trying to help you go, okay, here are some questions. And even I think YouTube Studio themselves are working on this, but allow you to kind of, if you only had five minutes, which comments should you read? If you can only respond to 10, which 10 should you respond to? And trying to just help be an assistant in that way of helping you to hopefully have a better connection with the community through that. And look, it sounds like both of you are saying that it's an additive part of your workflow. It's like an assistant rather than an overarching part of what you do or taking away a big part of what you do. That's good to hear. Cool. Okay. Um, and just on a side note, you were mentioning that generator fill from uh, Photoshop, yep. right? That's run by the Firefly technology. They're bringing that to Premiere this year as well, right? Where all that stuff is going to come in for video and that is going to be amazing, I reckon. That's one that I'm excited, yeah, for video. Okay. Well, those are some of the good things, right? We're gonna let's, let's get on to some of the, the negative things <laughs> with the things people like talking more about. All right. Firstly, do you, for artists especially, I mean, you're in the actual art space, right? Um, and you make beautiful films, as you, you know, where there's an artistic element to all of the things we make. How much do you think it's going to take away jobs from, from creators? Um, as a creator standpoint, I don't think it will really take our jobs. Because, again, as creators, we are the faces of our brand. So AI to take over our faces is a bit hard. Um, people connect to people and not robots. So I think as a creator, um, I don't think I will lose my job because of AI. Um, but I, I do feel for other creatives, like, um, for example, uh, animators, graphic designers, um, I don't know how they can work around this or maybe for people, you know, translators, for example. Um, those are the jobs that I feel like, wow, that is, that is kind of... I'm, I feel that they would definitely feel the threat of it more than creatives who have their face forward. So I think it's more and more important to even, even if you are like an animator or what, is to have a personal brand, um, something that cannot be taken away from you as a creator. Because once you have a personal brand, you have a face to yourself, that's where AI is not going to take the job away from you. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I've definitely seen a lot of this firsthand. I just this week had someone that I follow on Facebook who made an announcement about AI. She makes adult colouring books and she commented that it takes her eight months to produce a book. And that's pretty standard for, for drawing, that it takes someone eight months to produce a colouring book. People with AI now with no previous even interest in colouring books are producing 30 a day. And those 30 books a day that they're making are on Amazon Marketplace right next to her books. And until we're able to, I guess, educate the consumers more, they don't know the difference. They don't necessarily know that this one was hand-drawn and this one wasn't. And I think from an artist's perspective, I guess – one of the biggest um, knife in the gut kind of moments of that is that the AI was trained off these very artists in the first place. So I don't know how much everyone knows about, more so sp speaking to the image generation at the moment, um, but a lot of them were trained off images that are publicly on Pinterest and on Google and not necessarily with the permission of those artists because no one saw this coming. It'll happen so fast, the laws haven't kept up with it. And so a lot of these artists are finding that they're now competing against things that are mimicking their own work and was trained on their own work and they can't possibly compete because AI can mass produce things in seconds and no human can possibly do that. Yeah, I want to come back to that in a second. But, you know, something you, you mentioned before about those, all those books going into the Amazon marketplace, right? How much do you think an audience who's after colouring books, for example, might care that, okay, I can buy these images for like five dollars or buy these other ones which which look really similar for like 20. Yeah I've seen the argument and I see the same thing happen with like Timu for example um, where in Facebook we have a lot of personal communities and a lot of them are trying to work out at the moment do they ban AI or do they not because they're, they're all facing this backlash in this art space and a lot of the people buying the books are justifying it for themselves in saying I want to support artists but I can't personally afford it and therefore it's okay to buy AI art. And so they, people make whatever justification they want, but even the people that are saying they will support human artists when it comes to their money will still choose the cheaper option because the, out, the outcome for them looks the same. The AI art is very impressive. It can produce a better colouring book than I can and that's what I'm working on this year, 
but I can't compete with with the quality because um, in the art space, the generative AI has developed so far that it is producing stuff that's better than people. Even though it has flaws, the average person can't see those anymore. And do you think that as a creator, you know, having that connection with your audience and you putting forward your art book, they'll have that connection and say, hey, I want to support Sarah or that comes from you so I'm more likely to use it? Yeah, personally, I'm not scared of it for my job. Um, I am working on a colouring book this year as an exact example and I'm not worried it won't sell but that's because I've had the opportunity to grow my personal brand like you were saying. Um, people know me. They watch me do the art. My art doesn't sell because it's magnificent. It sells because of who I am and my content. Um, I guess the concern is for those people who don't manage to rise above the crowd. AI art I think is going to wipe out a lot of mediocre artists and I don't mean mediocre as a, as – to be offensive to those people, but for people that are trying to get better, there's like this middle ground now that is flooded with AI and they're going to have to rise above that. And rising above that is the key, but it's also a lot harder for a lot of people. Now, um, the two big image generator programs, DALI and Midjourney, all right, they're right there. So DALI's from OpenAI, right? You were one of the beta testers for DALI, right? Yes. Yeah, so I had access to DALI um, before it was public. They were sort of giving a few hundred people and then a few thousand people access at the start. And my first impressions was I was actually very excited um, and I took it to quite a few of my friends because this was something at that point. I, my first pictures were like making my cat on a skateboard and I was over the moon. I was like, look, my cat is skateboarding. Now that just seems so simple, right? But this was the first time we'd seen something like that. And um, it was interesting hearing the responses of my other artist friends that are artists and creators as well. They kind of are in the same boat as me where they're creating on camera. So there's always going to be that human element. Um, but it was very much a 50-50 split of those that were excited and kind of like awestruck by this new technology and those that just their first reaction was, this is going to take our jobs. There was definitely from day one a fear. And Sean, I guess in the video space specifically in like the cinematography space, there are some new phenomenal filters that adjust lighting dynamically, right? That, you know, cinematographers used to study years and years for and they can adapt almost instantly. How do you feel that's going to, you know, change the game? For me as a one-man person, a solo creator, that's great because <laughs> now we can use software to affect lighting, um, to do a lot of things that you would have to do in a set previously and now you can modify it in post. So as a solo creator, it's great. Um, more tools to, to do it at a far cheaper cost. But again, then that would affect the people in traditional media, um, say lighting people or with specific jobs. Um, definitely those will be a bit affected. Um, but um, yeah, it's tough for, for people in the traditional media. And for solo creators like myself, it's good news. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. It, it helps you with your workflow, makes things faster, understandable. And cheaper. Yeah. Exactly. Now, we, we, you mentioned before about the ethics of it, right? Now, these systems have to be trained by looking at huge bodies of content that's out there, right? And they have to be trained. So they're looking at copyrighted images, people who put their hearts and souls into, and it's basically looking at the patterns and adapting to create new out output. Obviously problematic to a certain extent. There are some who argue, isn't all art a, you know, they're inspired by something else people have seen in human art. But what do you say to that? Yeah, so a bit of background on this. Um, Dali was the first one and now a lot of them are creating their own data sets but a lot of them are built off the original ones. Um, they purchased a data set from a company and at that point these data sets were legal because they would scrape the internet but it was intended for research purposes. It was never seen as potentially something that could be commercial. Now, changing from that to AI and then the commercial use of AI now has happened so quick that there's been no laws written for that. There have been multiple court cases, people trying to sue for this stuff. But in summary, it's kind of like whether it's legal or not, most of the artists in the world whose art were in these collections think it's incredibly unethical because it is threatening their livelihood based off their work. And so pictures were taken from Pinterest, Instagram, like everywhere – and um, I was actually one of those people at the start that said, well, if your artwork's on Pinterest, it's already being pirated. It's already being used by people as a reference. And the thing that was often said back to me as well, and I do understand a bit more now, is 
one person copying a style is still their way of learning and studying and that's still going to take them a lot of time and they will out of that develop their own style. They're not a machine. A machine that can process and replicate instantly is a very different ethical conundrum compared to just people learning off this art. So because like I know when I'm learning to draw, I often get lots of reference photos and I'll use 20 different photos of a, of a subject and then I'll try and draw that. And the art community as a whole has spoken out and said they all think that that is okay, but that is not what AI is doing. AI is processing at a rate that no person could possibly keep up with and therefore it should be treated differently. Good. Mm. Sorry, now I forgot a question. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, um, no. in terms of obviously the, it has to learn, it has yeah. to adapt. How do you feel that is like, is it, is it really stealing if like all art is taken from somewhere else? Um, that's the part where, I don't know, it's where's the line? Because is it okay for the AI to instantly draw, you know, different kind of art sources and then just do it instantly? Is, is that where the line should be drawn? Um, especially for artists, because I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not an artist, but maybe I could ask you, like, is that where the line is? Oh, well, I think the difficult thing is that it isn't clear where the line yeah. is. And I know, so for me personally, my stance has been, I like AI that can enhance creativity, but I don't like AI that replaces creativity. And so I am quite comfortable using ChatGPT to generate ideas. But if I have ChatGPT write a final blog post for me or a final piece of something, that is taking that job away from a writer that I would have otherwise hired. And that's where I think it is such a tricky thing because I, I do think it opens a lot of doors and it has really made a lot of things accessible to a lot of people. People that aren't artists can make better thumbnails, for example. But then you've got people that would have been hired in a lot of those cases that are now not getting the work. And so it is a grey area and I feel like it isn't as clear cut as a lot of people would like it to be. Um, but I do know that it's heartbreaking for me seeing, say, the colouring books on Amazon. If it was from an artist who was already drawing and they've used the AI to enhance their art, I feel like personally I'm okay with that. But what we're seeing is people that previously invested in crypto and that was their thing and now all of a sudden they're a colouring book artist and it's this shift because the technology has allowed them to do that and I mean I guess even with the internet when it came out you've got all the positives of the internet but then it also increases all the scams and stuff like that that are available with the help of the internet I think AI is similar in a lot of ways it's going to help a lot of creators and be a really useful tool but misusing it also opens up a lot of doors deep fakes all that. Yeah, fair enough. And look, um, the other aspect, you guys have both said like, it can help with ideation and planning and stuff like that too. What about hallucinations? And if you guys are not sure about the term, AI obviously looks for patterns. Sometimes it doesn't get it right and it gives you an answer which is not correct, right? It's a hallucination. Now, the problem with that, it says it with such conviction that you say, yeah, this must be true. It's, it, it looks right. Right? What do you think that the problem is going to be there where it starts giving you things? So here's an idea. You ask it to do research for you. What are some great ideas for travel in this place? And it comes back with something which is completely wrong. It could even be offensive to some audiences. What would, what's your thoughts on that? Um, for me, it's about leaning into your intuition um, and experience in content creation. And always do your research as well. Don't 100% rely on the answers from AI. If you feel like, okay, maybe it's a good idea, but I should fact check it. So I would say go back to the you know, usual Google, make sure information is, the information is correct. And then also um, make sure that um, you feel it's right because only you can tell whether or not something is right or wrong. If you completely rely on a you know, machine um, to do something, then um, yeah, it, it's off like that, yeah. Yeah, I think um, it comes down to you are responsible for what you produce. And if you have the AI helping you, it's the same as if you had a staff member helping you. If they write something offensive, you as a company or you as a creator are the one wearing that. And in fact, there was a case not too many months ago where an airline had a chatbot on their website and the chatbot promised someone a refund. And then the airline said, actually, that's incorrect. The chatbot got it wrong. We're not going to refund you. And I believe the court sided with the person asking for the refund because 
the chatbot was representing them. It was as if it was a an employee on their website. Um, I think when I'm using research, when I'm using it for research, for one, I always double check everything. But you do have to consider that ChatGPT isn't primarily a research tool. It's actually a conversational tool. So if you use it like that and talk to it and bounce off ideas, but don't expect it to give you every answer. And if it does give you answers, you need to Google them for yourself and find your own references and make sure that you've got accurate information, exactly like you said. Right. And look, I know we're nearly finished here. I can't quite understand how this timer works, but um, I'm going to ask one more, one more uh, key thing. And I know this is something that um, you know we've come across lately. So we're part of a, a Discord group, um, and we had this issue come up. And I'll, I'll let you sort of run through the issue. But it's just the idea of like deep fakes about pretending, right? Um, do you want to tell the story of Physics Girl? Yeah. yeah. So we came across as a group of us that um, came across a website recently that was offering that people could spend ten dollars and talk to um, talk to their favorite YouTuber, but it was all AI based. So and it wasn't pretending not to be. It wasn't pretending it was the real person, but it was saying that with AI you can have a conversation with this person. The problem is this website didn't actually get permission from any of the YouTubers that they were featuring. So they've just gone and taken a bunch of photos of people, trained the AI on their past content and created chatbots. Where this got really mucky, I guess, is there was um, a YouTuber known as Physics Girl who's still going through a whole bunch of health stuff right now with long COVID. And she'd been out of action for at least a year at this point, bedridden, not able to make any content and she was one of the creators featured on this website and so a few of our friends wrote to the chatbot and said hey how are you feeling and she came back and just told them about the video that she was working on and it was all obviously just the hallucinations like you're saying it told them about some of her videos and the video she was working on and it had no context of what she was actually going through because they've obviously obviously just trained it on her back catalog and not actually got permission which is really bad for her audience, but also just kind of yuck, I guess. It was a horrible feeling. It's exploitative, yeah. How about yourself, John? Have you seen anything like that where there's, you know, the problems you've seen with like faking or these hallucinations that come up? Um, personally, I have not heard any horror stories. I mean, on TikTok, I've saw someone who used deepfake to impersonate Tom Cruise. And then, you know, he did a few interesting scenes of that. It was entertaining. It was entertaining as a viewer. And um, it, I would say some, even for me watching it for the first time, I thought, oh, is that Tom Cruise? Like for real, he has a TikTok account. So um, it can be a bit misleading, especially um, and, and for your case, you know, the, the original creator wasn't even informed. And, and if people use it to profit from the original creator then, and then the original creator is not, earning any revenue from that. And I think it's a bit unethical. Um, but as an audience perspective, it could be entertaining or they could get certain value of just, okay, how would it feel to be interacting with like Taylor Swift, for example? Um, you know, audience might be interested to find out. But as a creator perspective, then that is, again, very grey, can be a bit unethical. Yeah. To add to that too, I also, another example of the deep fake situation um, I play Candy Crush. I don't know if anyone's a fan here of Candy Crush. But you get ads. <laughs> you get ads when you run out of lives or you want more bonuses. And I kept getting served this ad over and over of Mr. Beast promoting a giveaway. And in the past, that was much easier to spot fakes. Um, but this was his face. It was lip synced. It was his voice. And then it was a whole bunch of footage probably from one of his videos of him with cash and stuff like that. And it was advertising for a mobile game that is not associated with him in any way. And I know he's not the first one to have a deep fake replicate. Like you think about scams where they say, oh, this celebrity endorses this. That's already happening with deep fakes now where it's really unclear if it's the celebrity or not, unless you know what to look for, which a lot of us do. But there are a lot of people in the world that don't even know that AI is a thing yet. They don't know the possibilities. And so they see their favourite celebrity endorsing a product, they go buy it, and then they get the credit card stolen. So, yeah. Great. Well, look, I, we're nearly out of time. I'm going to ask you for your maybe top tool that you guys like we're using in a second. But it is interesting how much AI has progressed, right? Um, we were talking about Eleven Labs in the last session and the ability for the 
output is so incredible. Um, I've been, I've, like I said, I've got a session tomorrow talking about the top 10 tips, and I actually trained it on my voice to come back to it. And I sort of showed it to my daughter to see what she thinks. And I played it to her, and I thought it would be funny, and I was laughing, and you could just see how uneasy it made her hearing the machine talk on my behalf, and me trying to explain what that was, and it wasn't me. And I decided that that wasn't a good thing. I didn't feel right about it. I wasn't like, ooh, it's how fun this is. It's like, oh, this is not that great, maybe. <laughs> but yeah, so look, there are a lot of great applications. There are a lot of positive things, but there are a lot, a lot of things we've got to watch out for. And we are in the very infancy of the whole process, really. So as we finish up, let's know. What are your, what are your top tools, or the tool you, you'd recommend most in the, in the AI space to the group? For me, it would be Photoshop, generative fill. I think that it's a... Uh, Top tool for anyone, you know, anybody who is just taking a photo from your phone. Um, this technology, I think, is widely applicable to anyone, you know, daily users. You don't even have to be a creative to do so. Um, the other one, AI tool, I would say, for me, is audio cleanup. Um, yeah, um, to clean up noise or what. Um, I, I do... I recently got an, a plugin that is not from Adobe. So um, it's able to clean up noise while still retaining the quality of my voice. So um, that is um, something that I use a lot. Or to clean up echo or reverb in a room. Um, something that um, if you're particular about, then it could clean up and remove echo. Because in previously, um, without all these AI tools, echo or reverb is one of the hardest things to remove yeah, in post. So um, these are the top two tools for me. I was going to say with the Echo and that, actually even further than that, some of the tools in the programs now, so in DaVinci, which is what I use, um, but also in Premiere and a few of those, the audio tools, I've had a few times where we've been out in public and there's been music in the background and it cleans up the audio to, st to sound like it's recorded in a studio and the, or the music is gone. That for me was just like, whoa, that's magic. Um, but also Photoshop, yes, it's got the generative AI, but what I use actually more is some of the different selection tools for color correcting. So if, I'm, if I've done, uh, especially if it's bad lighting, done a photo shoot and I've got it all in raw of myself for some thumbnails, um, I can actually tell it to select my hair or my eyes or my skin and I don't have to select it. It just recognises that that's hair and it selects it. And then whatever change I apply to that, it can apply to every other photo and it recognises the movement and still finds the hair or the skin in every single photo. So for me, that's actually saved a lot of time. I can imagine. Well, guys, thank you so much. I know we're running a bit over time. We're going to get the next session up. So thank you so much for joining us. Very thank you so much.